Landscape and sky, bracken and heather, and gritstone tour. Uh, setting up of places of execution is a really kind of common thing in England. An abandoned place, lost in the black earth, lost in the dark age. Look this is miles. From the ancient world to the medieval, can any trace remain? An earth rampart, a cold stone wall, a frontier fortress, or a folly? The mystery of Karl War. The medieval world, the 5th to the 15th century. Tim Sutherland is one of Britain's most experienced archaeologists. He and a team of specialists try to understand medieval life by exploring the realm of the medieval dead. We have a classic view of the storybook medieval life. We don't hear the stories about the common man trying to keep his family alive. Archaeologically speaking, we can now focus in on the medieval dead people. You couldn't help almost look through their eyes thinking, what did they see? How did they die? Of all the landscapes of Britain in the medieval period, the hills and uplands were the most remote places. From Cornwall to Scotland, the great moors, fells or heaths reached for scores of miles, dividing the more populated areas like inland seas. Few people lived there, fewer still travelled through them. Forbidding and dangerous, they were lands at the periphery of society, the home of robbers and bandits, or worse. The uplands were places of folklore and superstition, places that were unknown, uncomprehended, and to be feared. Tombs and burial mounds, standing stones and henges, castles and hill forts, uplands like the north of England and the Peak District. On the moors to the west of Sheffield lies a site which baffles archaeologists. Carl Wark is said by some to be like no other place in Britain. Its appearance is unusual, foreboding, monumental, unique. It's known as a hill fort, an enclosed outcrop looking out over the Hathersage and Burbage moors. But it's a fort which doesn't seem to belong to any one period in history. When it was made, or who made it, and why, is all unknown. It's even possible it's not a fort at all. Was it for refuge, or ritual? A fortress, or a burial place? Very little is known for sure. Surprisingly, for a site of its impressive size, hardly any archaeology has been carried out there. The most commonly heard theory about Karl Wark's origin is that it's a hill fort which dates to the very earliest part of the Middle Ages. From the end of the Roman occupation in 410 AD to the Norman invasion of 1066, the period of Britain's history is known as the Dark Ages. It's called the Dark Ages um, for all sorts of reasons. The main one really is the lack of sort of written evidence that we have from the earliest part of the post-Roman period. 
for the 5th and 6th centuries and into the 7th century, with very, very little really in the way of, uh, of, of explicit documentation or, or, or written evidence. But this perception began to change through the late 20th century, after a series of startling archaeological discoveries. Perhaps the best known of these was Sutton Hoo in East Anglia, with its stunning finds from a great 7th century ship burial. Things like the Sutton Hoo ship burial really turned people's minds around to thinking of this not just as a sort of a, a decline uh, in, in social terms following the, the Roman, uh, the Roman um, setup, um, but actually see it as a kind of like a re-emergence of um, what then eventually becomes the unified kingdom of England by the 10th century. We have a mental image of the Dark Ages, but in fact, it's anything but. It's a sort of a misnomer in some ways, but it derives from the fact that we used to know very little about it. We have a huge amount of really good archaeology, some of the nicest jewellery, the gold work, the sort of flamboyant side of the things that we find. For example, at Sutton Hoo, it's really impressive and it's anything but what we would term dark. Karl Wark might well date from the Dark Ages, yet the written sources that do remain to us from these times, like the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, contain no known mention of the place. On such an apparently strong and powerful site, history is, so far, silent. It makes it hard for archaeologists to make a straightforward judgment. Karl Wark's a complete enigma. I think we could probably place it in the Anglo-Saxon uh, uh, period, um, but it, 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 it's, uh, it, it's an odd one. When I look at Karl Wark, I see somewhere which is quite a foreboding place, and it doesn't fit neatly into another archaeological type site. So maybe that its sort of distinctive, unusual configuration, its remoteness, because it's not that hand easy to get to, and it's slightly foreboding air has put a lot of archaeologists off from excavating it and investigating it. The mystery of Carl Walk is something that's clearly engaged people's minds and thoughts for a long time. It doesn't fit into any known pattern. And so it becomes impossible to fix it in time, specifically or in a culture, specifically. We just simply don't know who made it and when it was done or why it was done. So that, to me, is the mystery of Karl Wark. What we do know about Karl Wark begins with the geology. Bill Bevan worked in the Peak District National Park for 17 years and he knows the area very well. Carl Walk as a natural feature is a plug of quite harder gritstone. So when the gritstone was being eroded due to rain, due to weather, uh, such as wind, by the rivers, the softer beds of gritstone were washed away, turned into sand and grit. The harder beds were left standing. It's got sheer cliff edges on three sides and it sort of joins the valley side at its western end. So it's a natural feature. It would have formed millions and millions of years ago. And as a feature in the landscape, it presumably attracted people's attention throughout thousands and thousands of years of human occupation of the Peak District. Tim Sutherland has come to the Peak District to learn what he can about this enigmatic site. Local author and amateur archaeologist Mick Savage is from Sheffield and he grew up just a few miles from here. He's always been fascinated by Karl Wark. When you live so close to the Peak District and you see things like Mam Tor and you see things like the lead mines and eventually you find somewhere like Karl Wark uh, or Wark, some people say, we always called it Wark, then it just intrigues you as to want to know why and, and who did it and, and how old is it? He was so intrigued, in fact, that he wrote a book about it. It's still the only one in print which focuses solely on Karl Wark and its history. I've always enjoyed writing and um, I thought it's an ideal thing. And 
as you say, it, it, there were no other books I could find. I would look at the Ordnance Survey maps, always loved maps. You'd see that Gothic writing fort and, and so on. And then it would be down to town, to Sheffield, to the archives. I used to spend a lot of time in the archives. Um, and I think that's where I would really start to see some of the stuff that I included in the book, some of the references. Mix agreed to show Tim around and explain what's known about one of the Peak District's most mysterious historic sites. When you look at Carl Walk, it does ask, it asks you questions about your place in the world, I think. It's a bit like something out of an old western, you know, you're looking up at the canyon and you've got these maze and features and that still strikes me now. And it's quite an emotional impact when you walk along the valley and you see these big fortress-like cliffs rising up. It's something that is a bit primeval, I guess, for somebody living in the 20th or 21st century. And if you see somebody then stand on the edge of it, it brings that a feeling that of grandeur, of a landscape that is a bit more special, a bit bigger than most of the places we live in in England. From Higa Tour, looking down over Karl Wark, it's a monumental landscape. It commands a view for miles to the south over the Peak District's Hope Valley. And from the south, Karl Wark and Higa Tour dominate the northern skyline. So you start to see now the general size of it, its height. It's certainly got more of a scale to it when you come up from underneath it like this. It's certainly a strong position, if Karl Wark's purpose truly was as a defensive fort. It sits atop a spur off the hanging valley beneath Higator. The natural steep slope bounds it on three sides. And on the fourth is Karl Wark's most striking feature. A 40 metre stone rampart banked with turf eight metres deep. Made of boulders hewn from the very gritstone on which Karl Wark sits. The wall would have been taller when it was built. A formidable defence, which bars access to the natural plateau beyond. So it's, especially in this place, I mean, this is nearly three metres tall. I mean, it it's is. not a little wall, is it? No, not by any means. And who knows where the original ground surface is here. Could be a metre down yeah. with a build up here of yeah. the soil and the turf. Shall we go and look at the yeah, entrance? Yeah, excellent. Thanks. The entrance is defended by two large semicircular bastions, like the Barbican of a medieval castle. Inside there's a level area, the only obvious part of Karl Wark where its conceivable buildings might once have stood. The rest of the interior is a maze of large earth vast boulders, with seemingly little room for buildings, at least along the lines of conventional huts or roundhouses. An obvious place for a stronghold, yet with no features to tie it to any one era. It could have been made in prehistoric times, the Roman era or the Middle Ages. It's an archaeological mystery that Mick has pondered for many years. To local people living in Sheffield and the area around here, once you start to talk about something like Carl Walk, say, yeah, it's always puzzled me, but doesn't it say it's Iron Age? Yes, it does on a plaque, but that doesn't mean that it really is. It's not a classic hill fort, that's blindingly obvious. Although elements of it look as though they are. This looks like a rampart. Mm. And yet you look on other parts and it's not like anything I've ever seen in terms of hill forts or defensive enclosures. But it, it just doesn't jump out at you what it is, does it? No, that's not the problem at all. with it. No, no. Is this a meeting place from the Bronze Age? It could be. It could be the place where people gathered for meetings, who knows? So then you step forward in time. Um, and, and you come into the Iron Age, which is what this tended to be thought to be, because Iron Age equals hill fort. We've looked at the features, it's got a few of them. You've already said it's not got all of them. Uh, and then along come the Romans. If this was occupied at that time as a defensive hill fort, 
the Romans would not have left it alone. Could it have been built in that period in between when the Romans left? So in the sort of whatever we call the Dark Ages, the Dark Ages, Roman period, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah. And, and so on, and beyond there. Um, we are on the border, the Mercia-Northumbrian border, and literally on that border, um, there was all kinds of problems and strife until uh, the, this, the, there was a truce. So it could have been something to do with that border. This right. remains an enigma. Yep. Enticing though they are, they are just theories. The big problem really was trying to get a handle on what Carl Walk was about, when it, was date, when it dates from and what it was used for is that there's no real evidence archaeologically. And that's not unusual because most sites, most hill forts, hilltop enclosures in the Peak District have not been excavated or have only been excavated to a really small amount. When we look at Kalwark and we try and say, well, it's got to be one period or another, it was a hill fort or it was a refuge or a ceremonial, we're really starting from a, a blank canvas. And anybody who tries to say it was one thing or the other is really speculating. It is a real enigma, basically. Nothing has ever been found here to give even a vague historical date as to when it was built, nor even its use for any purpose at all beyond the last few centuries. Who built these walls and then vanished into time, leaving no trace? There's no evidence so far, but that doesn't mean nobody's tried to find any. In England, every county archaeology unit has its own SMR, a Sites and Monuments record. Tim's in Sheffield to have a look at South Yorkshire's SMR. He's heard it contains details of some archaeological work carried out at Carl Wark many years ago. Perhaps there's some information here that will help, something that was missed before. Um, we've only been in existence since 1974, more or less, um, but there's been interest in the site for a lot longer than that. Um, and we've collected what we can together. There's no doubt other stuff, uh, but this is what we've got, so I can talk yeah. you through this. Yeah, it's an important site, it's an impressive part of the landscape, and it's, it, people have been interested in it for, for a long time. The earliest mention of Karl Wark is by local antiquarians of the 19th and 18th centuries. There's a Heyman Rook, uh, did a walkover survey of the site. We've got a few um, copies of pages from his notebook in here. Among the files, Zach has found the record of the only known archaeological dig to take place at Karl Wark, just after the Second World War in 1950. In 1950, a chap called Simpson put um, a trench through the turf wall. We've got the, the diagram in here. All right, yeah, yeah. Which is what you want to know, is you know, how, how uh, what's the wall and the rampart made of? So he says it's uh, basically turf and stone revetment. There's no report from Simpson's dig, no record of anything he found in the way of artifacts, just the illustrations of where he dug, his trenches, which oddly changed direction. Perhaps Simpson was searching for evidence of buildings in the open area inside the wall. Yeah, that's not right. Come up with definitive evidence, has he really, as far as we, we know? Well, he's, um, he's, he's told us how the rampart was constructed. Yep. And like I say, there's, there's little else, um, yeah. unless he got lucky and you know, managed to find something else with his other trenches. But as far as I know, he didn't. It's tantalizing. Maybe Simpson kept notes, but they're lost to us now. The dig plans give us something to go on though. They'll help us put together a case to reinvestigate the archeology span and hopefully carry out a new survey at Karl Wark. It's a scheduled ancient monument and so, as ever, it will take time for the necessary permissions. Meanwhile, what parallels are there for Karl Wark in the Peak District? If it were much earlier than the Dark Ages, are there other places which have similar characteristics? The description Hillfort often leads us to think Iron Age. If there's one site in the Peak District that's the epitome of a Hillfort of the Iron Age, it's Mam Tor. It's just 10 miles from Karl Wark, but a world away in scale and design. The deep banks and ditches enclose a hilltop fortress over a thousand meters in circumference. 
Many platforms have been found, and there were perhaps dozens of buildings here once. Enough to house a large population in safety during times of crisis. Karl Wark is completely different to Mam Tor. Most Iron Age hill forts are quite big sites. They tended to have, they've got evidence for occupation inside them. They're an enclosed settlement of some sort. People were enclosing them either because they had to defend their settlement due to warfare, a bit like the nuclear deterrent of the time, or it was about status. They're shown off. You know, whoever is the leader of that tribe, the chieftain or whatever, can mobilise lots of people to build some big ramparts, some big banks and ditches, that's saying, look, I'm fairly boss, I can control all these people, you know, I'm an important man, you don't mess with me. Karl Wark has the feeling of something more workmanlike, more improvised, and there's no known spring or well, so it probably couldn't have supported a large population for long. Mam Tor, uh, in the Peak District, not far away, as we said, is built around a spring, so if that's the interpretation of Hillfort's defended settlement, you'd be quite happy living on Mamtor. You've got your water supply. That doesn't happen with Karl Wark. So that really questions, can it be a Hillfort in the normal sense of an Iron Age Hillfort? There are other sites in the Peak District with walled enclosures that might not be Hillforts as such. Garden's Edge, a few miles away near Baslow, has been dated to the Bronze Age. But what the walls enclosed is unknown. Perhaps it was for some ritual or ceremonial purpose. The problem with this and other sites in the peaks is the same. Where are the dead? These acidic soils rot anything organic. So whether that's metal, or whether it's iron, whether it's human bone, animal bone, leather, cloth, etc which really reduces what we can find and what survives from the past. On the whole, the only way that the dead survive uh, in this landscape is if they were cremated first and put in a pit or a clay pot or a bag and buried together. The burnt bone survives. But otherwise, human internment in the form of skeletons just leaves no trace. Within a number of decades, those bones have just completely rotted away. If people were buried within Karl Wark's enclosure, probably very little will now remain. Now there's a chance to build on what's known so far. We've been granted permission to go ahead with new work. It's the first at Karl Wark for more than half a century. By now the seasons have turned so although the site isn't exactly remote, it's not easy to access. Everything has to be carried in on foot. The fast-flowing Burbage Brook and the steep, boggy terrain of the approaches demonstrate the strength of Karl Wark's position. It's maybe another reason why few people have done much archaeology here. It's hard going to get all the kit onto site, but it's worth the effort to see the view. Wow, flipping egg. You can see for miles. The gap in the weather won't last long. They have to get the survey going. No one has ever attempted geophysics at Karl Wark, so it's a real first. The survey is aimed mainly at the area immediately within the stone rampart. It seems the most likely area where we might be able to find traces where buildings once stood. What Simpson was presumably looking for with his snaking trenches in 1950. And as part of the survey, we'll try to locate exactly where these trenches were. There are various factors to take into account. The depth of the soil here is unknown, and there are obviously a lot of boulders above and below the surface so the rock may affect the magnetic signal. They'll use several techniques, along with the standard magnetometer. Emma tests the magnetic susceptibility, or MAG-SUS, of selected areas. 
This measures the soil's potential to become magnetised by, say, burning, so it can help identify possible hearths or rubbish fires. To cover wider areas more quickly, Chris uses the large aerial EM31. Not easy in driving wind on Karl Wark's exposed plateau. With such a short time on site, it will help him cover the ground. At the same time, we'll carry out a photogrammetry survey using an aerial drone. From this, we'll hopefully create a 3D terrain model of Karl Wark. It's the first time for this as well. It's a lot to get done, and Karl Wark can be an unforgiving place when the weather closes in. This is the Peak District's eastern extreme. Karl Wark is a sentinel on the edge of the hills. This is border country. It may have always had some importance because of its proximity to this border zone, which goes back at least to Roman or late Iron Age times. But whether as a fort, settlement, meeting place or sacred place, we can't tell. To us now in 21st century Britain, the most significant period in this story of the borderlands is the Dark Ages. From the late 6th and early 7th centuries, this was the frontier between Mercia and Northumbria, powerful and competing kingdoms. There is evidence that the Peak District was under the influence of the Mercians and under the influence of Northumbrians at different time, and that the Northumbrians sent Christian missionaries down to the Peak District because it was a pagan Mercian. Uh, area. And you also get the stone crosses, which were built as sort of wayside preaching crosses or as boundary markers. Anglo-Saxon Britain is a period which fascinates archaeologist Andrew Reynolds. It's a really interesting period to study because it tells us uh, about all sorts of aspects of human, the development of human societies. So we can look at things like the emergence of, of kings and, and kingdoms. Uh, we can look at things like the uh, emergence of, uh, of, of legal uh, frameworks, legal apparatus, judicial uh, activity. Uh, we can look at the emergence of towns and villages. So, for example, much of what you see in the modern uh, English landscape has its roots in the, in the Anglo-Saxon period. Andrew sees Karl Wark as being similar to many other fortifications in Britain from this period, which seem to utilise distinctive features in frontier areas. The kind of form of the fortification up here finds its best parallels really in what we call you know, either the Dark Ages or the, the Early Middle Ages uh, in uh, a series of fortifications which are very similar to those built in the Iron Age. And again, we tend to find these in northern uh, Britain, uh, in Wales and down in southwestern Britain. So in terms of its parallels, then, uh, uh, it, it really finds it, it, its um, best uh, comparisons in the Iron Age or in the, uh, in, in the uh, early medieval period. It's perfect for controlling movement in and out of the region. You know, we know it's a border area. Um, it marks this sort of, um, it's a very, very marked transition in the uh, nature of the landscape, the geology changes, the soil types change, uh, the vegetation uh, changes. Um, and given the nature of the topography, there are only a, really a, 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 a few ways that you can safely or easily traverse this landscape. And Karl Wax sits um, absolutely smack bang in the middle of one of, the, um, one of the freest routes of passage across this particular patch of ground. Wherever people travel across borders, you find powerful uh, expressions of um, state-like institutions. The main roads which today enter the peaks near Karl Wark are all relatively recent. The now disused Houndkirk Road was an 18th century road from Sheffield. So this is the routeway into Sheffield from here, seven yep. miles away. It probably followed the line of earlier routes, which must have passed near Karl Wark since at least Roman times. See, one of the things that you'd expect in a region like this, if you're crossing from one kingdom into another, is a gallows. And in, from the 7th and 8th centuries AD, um, you find uh, setting up of places of execution is a really kind of common thing in England. Um, it makes you fully aware that you're passing from one political territory into, into another. 
So given the importance of this particular region, a major routeway, a fortification possibly of that period, uh, this is exactly where you'd expect those kinds of territorial markers to be. So building a fortification uh, like this sends out a very powerful political statement. So you, in some ways you don't even have to occupy it. If you've got sort of your enemies uh, uh, up to the north, uh, you're setting up something which is staring them right in the face. Yeah, and basically what it's saying is somebody is here. It yeah. is not an open landscape. Something is here, we have constructed it, we are strong enough to do this, and we are, it is an exhibition of how we're powerful, even in this, this border region that we, we are in. That's how determined we are that this is, this is our border. So anybody coming from a, from a distance would come to this area and think, ah, something is changing here. It's a very, very powerful way of expressing uh, your uh, dominance of a, of, of a region at the margins of your territory. So this is why these early kingdoms set up things like gallows, uh, defences, they dig great big banks and, and ditches yeah. and so on. And especially when you set that in the context of emerging kingdoms, you know, they're trying to kind of forge large scale identities. And the way that you can do that is just start to map out the landscape. You start to name it in very, very distinctive ways. Mm. And they attempt to control it, yeah. to, you know, to, to fortify, strengthen around the borders. So that anybody coming from afar will think, aha, now we have to deal with these people who are capable of doing this. By now, the results of the survey are ready. It's taken time to get a handle on all the data, but it's been worth it. The photogrammetry reveals the natural promontory on which Karl Wark sits, dominating the valley below the natural steep sides of the eastern flank and the low but neatly stone-reinforced western wall. And the huge northern rampart, still impressive in its size and strength. Despite the tough conditions during the survey, the team were able to cover a large area within and around the enclosure. As expected, the rocky geology has affected the data, but not too badly. They've successfully located the trenches explored by Simpson in 1950. But like Simpson, they haven't managed to locate any obvious remains of buildings or other archaeological features. It's still a huge leap forward in research into Karwak, and the data will hopefully help with future archaeology. But the results have brought up some unexpected points. We've also got some linear features that seem to cross from one side to the other. There's one there and there's one there. But they're not definitive as in a, a definite ditch. So there's some sort of linear aspect to that, as if there's something there. But we don't know whether it's man-made or whether it's natural. It just could be just a cleft in the natural rock. So again, it's nothing positive. Perhaps most interestingly, the mag has revealed some surprising data. We've got these really weird anomalies like this area around there where it looks to be heavily magnetic with a, a sort of a halo of white round it. So there's one there, a very large one, but there's also smaller ones there and there's something there. Now some of these are definitely magnetic or rather ferrous metal iron anomalies. The distribution is similar to surveys Tim's seen of some battlefields. We know that iron doesn't survive in the ground here from ancient times due to the acid soil. If so, what else has been going on at Karlwag from more recent periods? Over the last few centuries, or even decades, different activities may have left ferrous metal in the soil. Quarrying, millstone working, even climbing and tourism have probably left their traces. During his work in the area, Bill Bevan noticed some strange marks on boulders. They're all over Karlwag. No one seemed to know how they got there. I'm trying to think, well, what could have made that? It clearly hasn't got the nice form of prehistoric rock art, so it didn't look like it was deliberately made by hand, but it clearly wasn't natural either. It looked a bit like, well, when I first thought, I thought, it looks like a fossilised bomb explosion. What could be creating that? When he interviewed older people from the area, Bill found out what had gone on here on the moors around 70 years before. The whole area had been a training ground for the army in the Second World War. One of the guys I spoke to had trained in the area and he talked about 
fire and mortars from Burbage Rocks towards Calwar. What they would do, they would try and target a big earthfast boulder and try and hit that with the mortars. And that's when it struck me that these are the scars of a mortar shell explosion. It's hit the rock, it's gouged out some of the, some of the boulder and left this, you know, random pattern. Um, and when I realised that, it, everything started to fit into place. British and Canadian paratroopers trained here before the D-Day invasion of 1944. Major Paul Oldfield served with the British Army for 25 years. He can help interpret the way the Army used the area in preparing soldiers for combat. The realism of firing live ammunition was essential, with mortars and other weapons. Well, it, it's quite a small area, uh, but actually it's perfect for, for low-level infantry training. So if you, if you are live firing in this area, anything that misses the targets is going to disappear uh, into one of those hillsides. Right. So you can actually stop it. Is this the sort of training you would have undertaken when you first started out? Yeah, uh, and it, it's very much the same as, uh, as uh, um, basic recruits will do nowadays. And you can see just over there, we're just coming up to one of the rocks. It, it quite uh, obviously has been engaged. Oh, that's, a, that's a cracker. Clearly been used as a target, yeah. And judging by where the holes are, uh, this is not, not an explosion from some kind of ordnance. These, these are bullet holes uh, because of the pattern they're in. So looking at where these strikes are, if you turn, look the other way, Tim, and then work out where the fire came from, well, there's all sorts of possibilities. You, you've got the, the, the near ridge here, probably about 150, uh, 200 metres away. But on the other side of the track, of course, you've got that uh, long spur running up to Carl Walk. That's probably 500, uh, plus the one beyond it. And of course, the, uh, the wide open ground to the left of the road there, uh, all that is uh, within a visual uh, range of, of, uh, of this rock. It's quite impressive, though, the distance. If, if that is 550, or so, we'll have a look at the map in a minute. I reckon I could still hit that. That's pretty impressive. That was a pretty good shot. <laughs> <laughs> the bullet scarred rocks are all around the valley, evidence of the intense battle train. The whole area was one big shooting range. That's quite impressive up there. There's no denying that. Absolutely. Well, obviously, given that pattern, there must be something physical there for people to fire at. I would have thought so, yeah. And, and given, given the angle that the, the bullets have actually hit, it looks to me very much like they were coming actually from Carl Wark itself, which is what? So it's probably 700 metres away from here, uh, at least. Uh, but they, they've hit direct onto the rock. There's no, there's no yeah. ricochets off and all the rest of it. But one thing we don't know is whether that's individual fire one after the other. Yeah, you know, from different people, or whether that is a machine gun. Difficult to multiple, say. Multiple, multiple fire, yeah. It's right, difficult to say, yeah. 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 But there are, yeah. there are little, little separate areas, as if, you know, there's either different targets or they're aiming. Sure, yeah. And, and even on the rocks over there, so it's not just one concentrated fire. Yeah. It's not just rocks that the troops were firing at. Beneath Carwark, it seems that Burbage Valley's historic pack horse bridge made a useful target. So you reckon there's some impact points on this bridge, do you? Well, there's some... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's some by, here, yeah. some by your feet there. Right. So you've got those two there. One, okay. two. Uh, there's some down on these stones. So and they're, to, they're to all those ones down there, Tim, look like they've hit head on. Straight yeah, on, I would say the so. Road. They're very circular rather than... And that uh, would indicate then the fire's coming from, from, so from over there. Basically. That quarry up, up. where we've just come from. Yeah. yeah very much so. Look, firing straight down this re-entrant onto an obvious objective for the infantry yeah. to go for. Yeah, it would be something worth seizing, an objective to give the infantry something to go for. Uh, yeah. Seizing a crossing point over a waterway is all, always important. And amazingly, there's still evidence here. And here's your proof, look. I can't see, believe uh, that. Yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? All the water's washed this out. Look yeah. at them all. They're actually in situ. <laughs> there, is a, there are actually some, some bullets, the bullet heads. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six is right in front of us. There's one over there. 
that's probably a tracer round. That okay, one, yeah. so we've got we've got the evidence. We've got the physical evidence on the bridge. We've got the pop marks where the bullets have been hitting. We've got the actual bullets. And it's unbelievable. I can't believe it. And it's only recently because it's washed out with the rain and nobody's ever picked them up. And as you say, these are definitely being fired because you, you can see the rifling marks on, on, on the bullets. Yeah, yeah. So they haven't just been lost. Inside Carl Walk, Tim shows Paul some of the many scars left by the mortar explosion. This, this plateau is littered with these, with these strikes and they're quite distinctive when you see them. There's one there. So we're oh, going to yeah. look at this one. Uh, you oh, see gosh, there, it's, yeah. you know, it's got a, it's got a centre and it's got mm -hmm. the, the splash marks. Yeah, we're looking at where, where the main impact point is and, and where the kind of the wings of shrapnel have come off it. It looks very much like it was fired from that direction. I mean, if this was a two inch mortar, uh, that would be very much extreme range. So it could have been in this dead ground over there, or perhaps it was a three inch mortar, which would reach here uh, no trouble at all. Uh, I but mean, they're aiming up here, aren't they? They're obviously yes. aiming at yeah. this. If you, if you line them up, you know, there, there are lines that seem to go this way. Okay. As if, as if they are from, you know, a certain location. Well, and the, so the firing. From, from one location and then just increasing or yeah, decreasing Yeah, increasing the range. or decreasing, yeah. Right. So that's interesting. We're going to look at some more if you want. Okay. okay. Yeah. We've recorded the mortar impacts as part of our survey. In some cases, they show a possible line of fire as the mortars fell short, long, or on target. So we've got another example. This is, this is a nice clear one again. Oh, yeah. Uh, and also, we've got one of the most famous parts of this monument, it's Kai's chair, and <laughs> it's, it's not that far off it. Missed by three metres, yeah. Yeah, so... This looks much more like a, a vertical impact, or much more vertical impact, because the, the spread of the shrapnel is much yeah. more even all the way around it. Yeah. So probably fire from fairly close in. So it's, it's coming, coming straight down. Vertically, yeah, yeah, absolutely, ra rather than the traditional 60 degree angle. There are many bullet holes around the entrance which suggests it was used for a practice assault. Just metres away inside is the area where Simpson excavated his oddly zigzagging trenches. Could some of these have been leftover slit trenches from this Second World War training? Simpson was here just five years after the war. It would explain the unusual layout. Remains of the training up here were noted for some years after the war. There's even a story about the wood that was planted at this time, known as the Great Britain Plantation. Now, originally, it was, it was planned to be the shape of Great Britain. <laughs> and, and the bit at the bottom you'll see is missing on the map, uh, the bit that would be Devon and Cornwall, because it was sticking out onto this spur below us. Uh, and apparently, they didn't plant there because there's so much unexploded ordnance, they, they felt it was too risky. Well, that's that. interesting. Yeah. Now, whether that story's true or not, I, I don't know, but that, 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 that is uh, what, what I understand to be the case. From the recent past to time immemorial, soldiers have passed in the shadow of Karl Wark. But whether any fought or died here across the defences, no one knows. The place, its origin and its purpose retain, across the centuries, a cloak of silence. There's no doubt, though, Karl Wark sat astride a frontier for many years and between many tribes and kingdoms. Just a couple of miles away, at the village of Dor, two armies certainly came this way recorded in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. It was here, in the year 829 AD, that the Northumbrian King Eanred submitted to King Ecbert of Wessex, who thus became the first overlord of all Anglo-Saxon Britain. And mercifully, for once the armies left without ever fighting a battle. <laughs>